guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing, where our goal is to educate and debate specific stock investment ideas. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe to the channel and then watch your investment returns soar like an ostrich. All right, today we're gonna to take a look at a Micron and no, not the famous all plastic hockey skate from the 1980s, but the equally high tech business that operates in the semiconductor space. The stock doesn't pay a dividend, but I thought it was interesting because it trades at less than four times 2018 earnings and has $3 billion of net cash. And we know the semiconductor space can be cyclical, uh, but definitely intrigued to explore further. So let's jump into it. So Micron designs and manufactures semiconductors used in a variety of products, including computers and networking, cloud, mobile devices, and automobiles. And they've got locations around the world, as you can see here. Uh, they've highlighted them with white dots, which is a little tough to see, but a lot of their manufacturing happens over in Asia, and uh, they've got a base in North America as well. In 2018, the company held an investor day, and this is a slide from, from that presentation, which is about a year old at this point, uh, but it just talks about the demand growth for uh, processing power and the need for semiconductors. And I thought it's a really interesting slide because it just shows that, that over time, uh, the actual revenue uh, that the industry is generating has increased meaningfully. And the number of, of bits uh, that the data economy requires is, is massive. So I just wanted to put that up just to set the stage uh, from a secular demand growth perspective. That being said, this industry is highly competitive. Uh, the company competes with Intel, they compete with Samsung, uh, Western Digital is another one of their competitors, and there's significant pricing pressure. So while you've got a little bit of secular tailwinds, there's also a cyclical element uh, specifically as it relates to profitability. If we take a look at the stock price chart over the last five years, even though uh, when it's stretched out like this, it doesn't look that volatile, um, the low was actually around $10 a share in early 2016. And we'll see in a minute or two that the 2016 results were, were very challenging. And the high was a little over $57 a share, which occurred in early 2018. And we'll see as well that 2018 was a very strong year uh, for the business. The other thing that I'll point out here is that the CEO, Sanjay Marotra, he joined in mid-2017. His background, he founded SanDisk back in 1988. Uh, which was sold to one of their competitors, uh, one of Micron's competitors, Western Digital, in 2016 for $19 billion. So after selling, after that business was sold, Sanjay came aboard uh, Micron probably a little over a year later uh, and is the current uh, CEO. And not sure uh, how much credit to give him, uh, but obviously from a timing perspective since he's joined, uh, things have worked out pretty well, at least uh, in 2018 being a very strong year. As I said before, the stock does not pay a dividend. Uh, earnings per share was $11.51 per share in 2018. So that's a price to earnings ratio of less than four times. 2019 earnings per share from the street is expected to be $6.45. So materially lower, um, but that still is 6.7 times price to earnings ratio. So this video is going to look at the financial overview, the recent results, and then we'll conclude with key considerations for the stock as we always do, including the bull, the base, and the bear case scenarios. So let's jump into it. So let's start with the financial overview. And we'll just jump into the annual report here. And we're on page 30 of the annual report. So we'll just run through the revenue story. You can see back in 2014, revenue of 16 billion, flat in 2015, down in 2016 to 12 billion, and then has had a real resurgence up to 20 billion in 17 and 30 billion in 2018. Gross margin's been pretty volatile. They don't actually give you the percentage here, but I've calculated it. Uh, and it's anywhere from 20% in 2016, being the low, uh, to 60% in 2018. So Gross margins for, for most businesses don't jump around that much, uh, but the semiconductor space is, is known for that. And uh, they've had volatile gross margins uh, over the last few years. 
Earnings per share, again, sort of follows the same story. You've got 1151 in 2018, which is by far the standout if you look at the historical results. I think that's one of the things that this video is going to explore, is how much, how much of an anomaly was 2018. Um, 2016, you can see they lost money, so lost 27 cents a share. I think the last few things that I'll, I'll point out are long-term debt is, where are we here? Is down. It's down from nine billion in you know almost ten billion in 2017 down to just under four. Uh, they have a significant cash position, so the company has a net cash cash position overall. And the book value of equity with the profits, particularly recently, has climbed uh, to over thirty billion from from thirteen billion just a couple years ago. So as part of our detailed review, let's go to page 33 and just take a look at the operating income by division. So they've got uh, computing and networking, they've got mobile, they've got storage, and they've got embedded, uh, which is sort of like the, think about the auto industry, embedding chips into your car. Um, so they've got four different divisions. You can see here that uh, the the first one is the largest from an operating income perspective. You can see the volatility historically in the operating margins, and that's really what I wanted you to take away from, from this chart. Um, the company does have a pretty diversified uh, uh, set of business lines, but the profit margins can jump around from year to year. The other thing I wanted to mention was the, the ROI of the industry. And let's see if I can get this slide 19. Here we go. So again, from that same investor day, again, about a year, year old, the company presents uh, an interesting calculation for the industry, ROI, which they define as annual operating inc income divided by a five-year cumulative CapEx figure. And you can see that historically, historically it's been a tough industry from a returns perspective. You can see it kind of floating a little bit of above zero, a little bit below zero, basically between minus five to positive 10%. And it's really just in the last few years where we've, where we've seen that ROI pick up. And uh, again, part of our, our scenario analysis at the end is gonna look to whether we can expect that profitability to continue or will it revert to the mean. R&D and CapEx is the next thing that I wanted to point out. And that's on page 31, I believe. Here we go, of the annual report. So you can see, you know, in, in, in Micron's business, they need to continually invest in R&D. Uh, their products life cycle changes rapidly with operating in the technology space. Their semiconductors that they might have been selling three years ago may be obsolete. So they constantly need to be improving, uh, creating new products, and the company spends Historically, about 10% of revenue. You can see here 2.1 billion in, in 2018, 1.8 billion in 2017, and 1.6 billion in 2016. Uh, so there's a meaningful uh, R&D investment that flows through the income statement. CapEx, uh, which we can see on page 47. Here we go. So you can see there's a significant CapEx investment that's required as well. So as they build out uh, property, plant, and equipment, modernize their equipment, uh, they, they talk about in, the, in, in their uh, 10K, they talk about having to replace equipment every five to seven years uh, so that it keeps up with the industry and continues to advance. So the CapEx need for this business is one that isn't gonna go away. They're gonna constantly need to invest uh, in their business. And you can see right now that the CapEx that they're investing, $8.9 billion in 2018, is significantly higher than their depreciation expense. Uh, so there's an outsized CapEx investment. The other thing I'd point out is the company, from an IP perspective, has over 13,000 patents, um, which, you know, I am definitely not an expert in um, and can't really opine on, on how valuable their IP is. But uh, the business has been around for 40 years, and 
through their R&D efforts every year, they're building up uh, an IT portfolio. Okay, and that leads me to uh, the next thing that I wanted to review, which is the free cash flow. And I'm going to just jump back to the presentation. And what I did, I, I pulled this from the from the cash flow statement, but I, I wanted to go back a few more years than than the 2018 10K would allow. Uh, so I just decided just to build a quick chart and show you the free cash flow to equity holders. Um, now, there isn't really much debt in the business, uh, so the calculation wouldn't be that different. But just to be clear, this is this is net income plus depreciation, less CapEx. Uh, so as an equity holder, this is the free cash flow that you're entitled to. And uh, this looks at that figure over the last uh, six years. I'll note that in 2019, year to date, they've generated about $3 billion of free cash flow. So down from 2018, um, but still pretty healthy when you compare to the uh, historical figures. And really, I guess what, as I started to think about the story and recognize that profitability could be, could be volatile, uh, given the cyclicality and the competitive nature of the industry, I actually just added up the last five years of free cash flow. It's about a $15 billion of free cash flow. And I compared it to the current market cap, which is which is definitely not a, a perfect ratio by any stretch, but just wanted to think about how much cash flow on average uh, is it generating uh, if we if we kind of take into account a cycle. And that's about 30% of the current market cap. So if you divide that uh, very rudimentary, you just divide that by five years, it's about 6%. 6% free cash flow yield historically over five years. And of course the market is, is forward looking, but I thought it was an interesting uh, stat to benchmark. You can see in 2016, uh, free cash flow was meaningfully negative. And that I think is the one thing to keep in mind with this business. They lost 27 cents a share, which was a small net loss, uh, but they also need to invest uh, from a CapEx perspective. So the free cash flow figure looks it, well, is even worse than uh, than the net profit figure, and I think free cash flow is the right way to think about this business. So, with that, we'll just talk a little bit about um, recent results and considerations. And the first thing that I'll talk about is demand growth, and we'll get into their Q two. Uh, we'll get into their Q two uh, remarks in a second, but I just wanted to set the stage again, from this investor day presentation that they had, I think it's actually a really good presentation to start from if you're researching the stock. And they, they talk about the demand growth and that AI is a game changer, uh, more video, more requirements for memory and storage, uh, smartphones becoming intelligent, phones adopting, um, vehicles, autonomous driving, and basically just set the stage and the, and the narrative for the requirement for increased semiconductor computing power. And they lay out a couple of charts uh, that talk about it. And I think it's really the key to the whole story is whether you believe that this thesis is going to drive a whole new, basically a new wave uh, and maybe outsized profitability and cash flow for, for the business over the next five years. So, Without going into each of these slides, just leave it there. There's the investor presentation from their investor day from 2018 and recommend you uh, uh, take a look at that. If we actually jump right into their Q2 uh, prepared remarks, which they make available on their website, they do talk about a more recent picture of demand growth. Uh, so you can see and they segment it between DRAM and NAND. So they see here bit shipments, meaning the volume, beginning to increase in Q3. Demand growth strengthening in the second half of calendar 2019. So it's been somewhat of a challenging pricing environment. And I'm just scrolling down here. 
they're actually going to idle approximately 5% of their DRAM wafer starts, so basically pull back production um, as pricing has been soft. And what was the other point they want to make? Demand, here we go. They see the industry grow, uh, industry supply growing in the high 30s, and demand growth is in the mid 30s. So, again, just an interesting point here: demand from a volume perspective is growing at the mid 30 percentage points, um, which is huge. Uh, but supply is also growing, uh, and in this case, right now, currently, supply is growing even faster than demand, and so. Um, when you think about the competitive landscape, Micron's not the only supplier. Uh, their competitors are also building out new capacity, new products. And, uh, and right now, from a pricing perspective, it's, it's definitely weakened meaningfully since 2018. So you can see, you can read the full uh, prepared remarks. Uh, I won't spend more time on that particular aspect, but the one other thing I did want to mention from their recent results is the CFO talking a little bit about inventory, which can be a risk in this type of business. So inventory entered the quarter at 4.4 billion, increasing from 3.9 billion at the end of fiscal first quarter. Our fiscal Q2 days of inventory were 134 days compared to 107 days in the first fiscal quarter. The, the actions we've announced today, meaning uh, bringing in production, supply reduction, combined with improving, improving customer de demand, will begin to address our higher inventory levels. So the risk here is uh, the industry is rapidly changing. You've got $4.4 billion of inventory that you're holding. Uh, in time, if you can't work through that inventory, it may very well become obsolete. In, in a worst case scenario, in uh, a more moderate scenario, you're going to have to sell it at a much lower price, maybe even at a loss. So something to keep in mind again uh, with this type of business. So those were the key things that I wanted to run through. We went through those fairly quickly, but let's jump back to our presentation and talk about some key considerations for the stock. So I find this a really interesting story because it's a cyclical business. We've got pricing swings that are volatile and it's highly competitive and it's tough to have a differentiated product, but it's one that has a ton of secular growth, uh, volumes growing at 30 plus percent a year. So it's really interesting. Let's jump into the strengths. Strengths business, Micron's been around for 40 years. Uh, and as a tech company, if you've been around for that long, you've done something right. You've survived some ups and some downs uh, and they've got a long track record. So that's a huge strength and a positive. Number two, they're one of the industry leaders. Number three, uh, they do have IP. They've got 13,000 plus patents driven by their R&D spend. Again, I can't quantify what that's worth, um, but they've been around for 40 years. They've been investing in IP uh, and you know, uh, they have some value ostensibly in, in that patent portfolio. And fourth, strong balance sheet. So going back compared to just a couple years ago where they had a net debt position, the company's now in a net cash position. Key risks to the story, uh, we've talked about it a little bit before, little to no pricing power. So they're a price taker more than anything uh, for the most part. They've got inventory risk, which we just hinted at. Um, any buildup in inventory that they can't move might lead to obsolescence. Uh, three, litigation in the Chinese market. There was a note in, in the 10K, which we didn't talk about earlier in the video, um, but some of their competitors in China are suggesting that Micron and, and most likely some of their other competitors are infringing on some IP that these Chinese competitors have. Um, early days from what it sounds like from the note and no real way of, of telling what the outcome might be. But obviously I think there's a risk here just to the Chinese market in the company's ability to sell into that market. And, and last, of course, competition. It's a highly, highly competitive business. So what are the key drivers? And uh, this will really knock your socks off here. Supply and demand is really what it comes down to. Um, so it's super simple to say, but what does it actually mean? Um, you know, 
Micron operates in a space where there is clearly demand growth, there's volume growth, um, and as they talked about in their investor presentation, big data, AI, autonomous driving, all of the need for, for increased computing power and memory are driving that demand growth. But how does that compare with supply growth? And all of their competitors, everyone is increasing supply to meet that demand. And in a commodity-esque like business, um, if the supply growth outpaces the demand growth, as it seems to be slightly doing in 2019, you're going to see pricing come off materially. And that's why you're going to see your gross margins jump all around all over the place. So industry pricing and and then the last point is the product suite. I think, you know, while it's it's somewhat commodity like, um, there's real pressure to stay ahead of the curve. There's real pressure for Micron to develop new products, better products, uh, faster. Um, and how does their product suite uh, compare to their competitors? So those are the key considerations for the stock. And why don't we jump into our bull case and bear case scenarios. So reminder again, this is not exhaustive. I think, you know, this story really comes down to, in, in my mind after reading through um, the 10K, the investor presentation, some of the comments from the quarterly investor calls and, and modeling out a couple of the years, really comes down to whether you think the advent of big data and AI are going to drive outsized, uh, more consistent free cash flow relative to historical results. And we'll, we'll get into what I mean um, in a second. The other key data point before we jump in is just market earnings per share forecast is $6.45 for 2019 and $4.66 for 2020. So the market believes that profits are going to moderate. Again, from that $11 per share in, in 2018, the market right now is forecasting uh, earnings per share to drop off uh, meaningfully over the next year or two. So the bull case, big data and AI drive a strong secular growth story. Gross margins uh, are 45% plus, so above the historical 30% average. Again, 2018 delivered 60% gross margins. Um, but if you go back before that and you just kind of take an average of four or five years prior, it was about a 30% gross margin business. And in our triple B scenario here, we're going to talk a lot about averages because I think this, this business is going to jump around from year to year. So just thinking about it more as an average of five years. In the bull scenario, heavy CapEx investment is going to be required. Uh, if, they are, if there is that strong secular growth story, well, that's great from, a, from an earnings and a profitability perspective, great from a revenue perspective. Uh, but we'd be naive to think that Micron wouldn't have to invest a little bit more heavily to keep pace with that demand. So I put it in here as 10 billion plus, and uh, I think they're they're expecting 9 billion in capex in 2019. Average annual free cash flow per share of eight dollars. Uh, again, that's uh, I've modeled out a few scenarios, but that's sort of roughly I've sort of just rounded it out, uh, but that's roughly what it would drive over the over each of the next five years. And if we look at a 12% free cash flow yield, I used a little bit higher than 10% here, just given the nature of the business. I think it's a higher risk type business from an investment perspective. Um, so I wanted to account for that in terms of the types of returns that I would be looking for if I were to invest in the stock. So at a 12% free cash flow yield implies a share price of $66.67, which is up 54% from the current share price. So lots of upside if this scenario plays out. The base case, uh, pricing and margins stabilize in 2020, markets more or less balanced, the demand growth and supply growth are, are in balance. Gross margins don't revert way back to the historical average, but they kind of settle into that 35 to 40 percent range on average. CapEx investment moderates and probably comes back closer to uh, depreciation maybe in that five to seven billion dollar range and free cash flow per share of about four dollars again I, I didn't put it I didn't write it out here but over sort of a five year time frame and if you put the same 12 percent free cash flow yield uh, that implies a share price of thirty three dollars and thirty three cents so in this scenario 
uh, the share price we drive is actually 23% lower than the current trading price. Now, maybe we're being uh, a little bit too pessimistic, but in, in this sort of a base case, that's, uh, that's what we get. Okay. Bear case scenario. Uh, the bear case scenario is really 2018 was an anomaly. Uh, and gross margins revert to the historical 30% average. Average annual free cash flow of about $2 per share. And if you, if you go back before 2018 and you look at the free cash flow per share, it's actually less than that. Um, it, you know, keeping in mind that one bad year they had in 2016. So I think the average is around a dollar per share. Um, so in our bear side scenario, it's 2018 was the anomaly. Sure, there might be great volume growth. Yes, all of, you know, don't disagree with, with AI and, and big data, but it doesn't drive um, a shift in the profitability and the free cash flow generation of the business. Um, it's going to remain extremely low margin, and uh, the business is going to generate about $2 per share in free cash flow. This case obviously would not work out well for investors. Uh, the 12% free cash flow yield, that implies a share price of $16.67, which is down 61% from where it trades currently. So really interesting, um, a stock like this yields super different results. Um, it, you know, really tough to predict where the stock's going to go or where the profits are going to go. And because of that, the bull based bear case scenarios have really, really different, pretty high variance in the, uh, the between the bear and the bull scenario. So let me know what you think in the comment section. That's a wrap on our video for Micron. Uh, Please subscribe to our channel and check us out at ostrichinvesting.com. We'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand.